alcohol and also in yellow you'll see the uh, the graph for marijuana uh, and so we can see that between the ages of you know early teens into the early 20s um, when alcohol um, when the first consumption of alcohol starts, there's much, much higher risk of developing substance use disorder than if somebody starts drinking at, say, the age of 25 or 30. You can see that the risk of developing uh, substance use disorder uh, becomes much lower. Also, genetic factors play a role. For instance, if there's someone who uh, in the family, a parent, a grandparent, uh, who has a substance use disorder. OK. So we're going to look at the standards for healthy drinking. And these may be a little bit surprising to you. Um, some types of drinks contain more alcohol than others. And so we have the concept of a standard drink to compare drinks and talk about the amount that someone is drinking. So a standard drink, and this is a, a chart that uh, goes um, goes way back, so these containers may not be something that youth may be drinking out of, but 12 fluid ounces of regular beer, 8 to 9 fluid ounces of malt liquor, 5 fluid ounces of table wine, and a 1 and a, a half fluid ounce uh, shot of 80 proof spirits, all with the same amount of alcohol. So each one is a standard drink. So we're going to get into some audience participation, and we're, here's our first uh, quiz. And so here's an example of what you've probably heard referred to as a 40. And a 40 is malt liquor. So how many standard drinks are in a 40 of malt liquor? And I'm going to ask you to post your answer in the chat. Do you think that it's, I'm going to give you a little bit of help. Three drinks, four drinks, five drinks, or six drinks in an average 40 of malt liquor. This will give you a chance to use that little chat box and figure it out. Do we have some answers in the chat box? We do. We've got a couple okay. for three, a couple for four, and we have one person that says five. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in? How many standard drinks in a 40? So sometimes someone will say, well, I had one drink. Well, what was it? It was a 40. So 40 ounces of malt liquor. We're going to go back to our standard drink chart. Eight to nine fluid ounces of malt liquor in a 40. Okay, so let's do the math. 40 divided by eight or nine is about five. So who answered five? You're the winner. If someone, if someone drinks 140, they're actually drinking five drinks. Okay, so let's look at what the youth may be more familiar with. They're not drinking a 40. They, they're probably using a red solo cup. And uh, I used to post the song on the side here, but that's a little bit old now. But we're familiar with the red solo cup. Maybe your cup is blue, but this is kind of a standard container for uh, a house party. And so uh, we can look at the red solo cup. So if we look at standard drinks from the point of a party cup, um, conveniently, Solo has put some ridges on their cup that equate pretty much to where a standard drink would be. So the bottom, very little bottom lip is about a shot of liquor. There's a, a ridge that's a, a second from the bottom that's about five ounces of wine. There's another ridge that is about eight or nine ounces for malt liquor. And the second from the top would be one cup of beer. Um, so counting drinks can be an important um, thing to do in terms of um, relating to how much somebody is, is actually taking in over the course of an evening. And it's one way that we can measure, uh, you know, how much we've had. Of course, the recommendation is for adolescents not to drink at all. So let's look at uh, what 
low risk drinking looks like. And this could be a little shocking, even if you think about drinking that goes on, you know, around you in terms of what low risk drinking limits really are. Low risk drink drinking uh, on a single day for men is no more than four drinks on any one day. And for women, no more than three drinks on any one day. And then there are low risk drinking limits for week. No more than 14 total drinks per week for men, and no more than seven total drinks per week for women. So that could be seven shots, seven beers, seven glasses of wine, but those are the low risk limits. And to stay within low risk drinking limits, you have to stay within both the single day and the weekly limit. The reason that this is different for men than for women has to do with body size and, and fat content and so forth. So there's it's unfair, but there it is. The guidelines for men over 65 are the same as for women. And of course, there are no guidelines really for adolescents as alcohol use isn't recommended, but they would be even lower due to the risk of, um, of, of brain issues. So I want to talk a little bit about right now uh, COVID-19 and what's going on with drinking and youth and in homes. Um, so we're all people of all ages are kind of hunkering down together and not getting out to the bar, not getting out to a party. Uh, maybe parents aren't working. Uh, maybe even they've lost a job or working at home. They have more time on their hands. And so we have a lot of concerns right now about what might be going on in homes, not just in terms of modeling, in terms of drinking in front of children, uh, but that children may be exposed to more drinking than usual at home, and perhaps even more related uh, alcohol-fueled arguments or even increased domestic violence. So this is a concern right now, and um, you know we're, we're working with some prevention efforts um, with schools and social media and so forth, uh, but this is a concern that we currently have. Uh, current trend while we're sheltering in place, and it's called a virtual cocktail hour, which involves people uh, joining together using Zoom or some other social platform to drink together at home. <laughs> and so we're aware that we need to take care that children aren't present at these adult events, although, you know, they're, they're there somewhere. Everybody's sheltering in together. Perhaps it's after they've gone to bed. Uh, we need to take care that children aren't here and that also the risk of adolescents joining online and creating their own. They may not be drinking cocktails, or they might, but maybe something else, but uh, joining with peers to drink online. That's a current trend that we're concerned about. One of the reasons that this is really of great concern is that we know adolescents usually do drink in the home. Um, we do a biannual youth survey in Ulster County where we ask thousands of youth about their use and their habits, and we ask them where they usually drink. And you can see that they reported that almost all of their drinking takes place in homes. 28% said their own home, that was about 1,000 students, and 64% of them said someone else's home. So over 2,000 students that we surveyed said uh, someone else's home. So we put those two together. It's a lot of drinking that's going on at home, not so much sneaking into a bar or a nightclub with a fake ID or going to the park or a car. Um, so we're very concerned about what might be going on in homes. Um, and one concern while kids are at home is keeping track of alcohol in the house, alcohol being locked up, uh, not going missing from the refrigerator or the garage, and uh, so this is a concern. So we're going to take a look at some trends that you may or may not be aware of, trends and fads, and um, this is one that I actually changed the question because of COVID-19. I don't usually ask about home, I ask about school. Uh, what current fad has kids, including elementary school students, drinking alcohol easily found in just about any school? And I added in home at this point. And you can post your answer in the chat. And some of you may have heard this before, maybe not. 
What alcohol is available in elementary school? Do we have any answers in the chat? We yeah, the common name we've got one of uh, hand sanitizer, rubbing alcohol, cold medicine, cough meds, mouthwash. A couple more people said hand sanitizer. Absolutely. So yeah, and we're going to talk about most of those. The one that usually is in school um, wouldn't be so much medicines and things, but hand sanitizer. Ew! So the first time I heard this, I was kind of, you know, pretty shocked. And, um, you know, it wasn't so long ago that we didn't have hand sanitizer in school, and then they were pretty much put up everywhere. Well, hand sanitizer is about 120 proof, uh, which is 62 to 65% ethyl alcohol proof. You double the amount of ethyl alcohol, alcohol to get the proof in a, a liquor. And um, you think that this is pretty gross and hard to do. Um, kids do a lot of gross and hard to do things. <laughs> um, some of these fads that we'll see, you know, most of them will make you shake your head. But if we remember that kids are eating Tide Pods as a challenge, uh, heaping tablespoon of cinnamon as a challenge, which has nothing to do with getting high. Um, so we have some fads. So I looked at my hand sanitizer that I picked up at uh, ShopRite the other day, and the one that I got is 80% alcohol in a little, uh, little bottle, um, but I've seen some that are even higher. So we're concerned about this. There are things online I won't, won't uh, go into that would uh, kind of prevent people from um, from um, you know makes it a little easier to drink like adding salt and you'll find that they've um, done some things to the san sanitizer to make it harder to drink but it is a trend I want to talk a little bit about product placement when it comes to alcohol so this is a picture of the drink aisle at the Walgreens in Wappingers Falls, the one across from the Galleria by the uh, Cold Stone Creamery in that area. And so here's the drink aisle. And I just want you to uh, note, I was just in there look, doing something else and saw this, and it kind of, I was kind of taken aback. So. On one side, we have juice and Capri Suns and energy drinks. And right across the aisle, we have at the end of the aisle, straight ahead, you'll see a rack of frozen drink pouches. And we're going to talk more about them later. There's wine on the shelf. There's more frozen drink pouches kind of hanging. There's beer, beer pong balls, and then water. And this is from uh, Walgreens in 2013. I don't think much has changed. And um, it just kind of shows the availability of alcohol. The Capri Suns are in a box. So the frozen drink pouches look more like Capri Suns than the Capri Suns do in this particular store. And I just want to compare that to, here's the same store um, with their cigarette display, which is behind the counter. And it's a pretty boring display, really. Um, it's behind the counter. It's guarded. There's lots of warning signs. The packaging isn't so attractive. And uh, at the time I took the picture, the age to purchase alcohol was 18. Now it's 21. Um, but we have a different standard for packaging and placement when it comes to alcohol, which is colorful, available, um, even easy to just pick up and stick in your pocket, um, especially if you're wearing something like cargo pants with a side pocket. Uh, kids uh, shoplift these things fairly often, as opposed to being able to have access to tobacco, which we'll talk about later. Let's go back to alcohol pops. So this, these are what the industry calls alco pops. We don't usually call them alco pops in this area. You probably know them as wine coolers. Um, this picture is again from a shop right, a local shop right, and I stopped to take this picture while I was shopping because I noticed this rack right next to the ice cream aisle, and um, the the they're single bottles. They're priced ten for ten dollars. 
And I can't even find a Diet Coke for that much for a dollar when I go into a convenience store. So the price is really low. The access is easy. They're single bottles. Um, one of the things that we know prevents um, youth alcohol use is pricing. So if things are more ex expensive, um, they're less likely to be able to purchase them. The cost is low, the access is easy, and it's an aisle where kids might be passing by. And the flavors and the, attra the attractiveness for youth for these, um, you know, the companies may insist that they're marketed toward adults, but they're in very fruity, sweet flavors, very attractive to youth. And I think you've, you don't, if you don't think that alcohol companies actually market to youth, I wanted to show you this one from Rio, uh, with the Rio Hello Kitty version of an uh, alcohol pop. This is an alcoholic drink that is available, uh, probably not on your shelf, but that the company is selling in, in um, other areas. I want to take a look at, um, we in our aisle, we had seen kind of these uh, frozen drink pouches. And um, these are a lot like the Alka Pops. They're very sweet. They come in a couple of different brands. Uh, many of the flavors appeal to youth. Um, and these are the ones that you throw in the fridge and they get nice and slushy and they're great on a hot day. And um, you may have enjoyed um, one of these, but they come in flavors, again, that are very attractive to youth. But I want to especially point out that Seagram's makes a frozen blue Hawaiian version. And I haven't yet found a grown man who's looking for frozen blue Hawaiian drink um, when he's outside on a hot day. It's, it's arguably a Kool-Aid flavor. And they can say they're marketed to adults over 21, but the appeal to younger people is clear. And again, these are in single pouches that are easy to, uh, to shoplift or easy to conceal when you're going somewhere and bringing a drink with you. Uh, one of the, the um, things that contributes to youth drinking is they're being able to hide the alcohol. And so a great big bottle of rum is a little harder to conceal than something that's smaller and in a single serving. So I wanted to show you this. These are shot packs. And they're little shot-sized uh, laminated foil plastic pouches that are pretty reminiscent of uh, drinks children pack for their lunch. But these are filled with a high alcohol content. Some of them have vodka, tequila, whiskey, rum. And these very small containers make it easy to carry and conceal alcohol. Um, they're appealing to youth as they're easy to hide. And in addition, you can order many of these products online and have them delivered straight to home. And this is a big concern uh, now, especially while kids are home, we think, what do they even have access to? Ordering things online is a great way for youth to access alcohol. And if we think about when school is in, um, who is the first to get the mail at home? In a lot of cases, it's the teen who's coming in from high school before anybody else is coming in from work that can intercept a package. And on the websites to buy these items, you just have to check that you are over 21 and able to purchase alcohol. Here's another trend. And this is powdered alcohol. And powdered alcohol was developed by an entrepreneur who says that it's for uh, sportsmen, for hiking, biking, kayaking, backpacking, so that you can have a drink when you reach your destination. So it's a shot of alcohol in a powdered form. And it sounds kind of really gross to me. I don't know for youth because it's easy for them to uh, conceal. It's, it's really small. Add it to water and you get a drink. So something else that's easy to sneak in. Fortunately, if you look at the map on the bottom, since I started doing this presentation, many, many states, the ones that you see here in red, have um, recognized the danger to youth from these products and they're banned in states. However, they're still available through the mail, and um, some of the states where these are allowed, like Colorado, 
Uh, we know that our youth are obtaining lots and lots of THC content products from states that have legalized marijuana and um, it can also get the alcohol sent through a, kind of a third party site or a friend somewhere else and delivered through the mail. So I don't know about you, but when I was a teen, alcohol tasted pretty gross. It was kind of a rite of passage to have to drink alcohol that tasted really bad. Um, I'm going to really age myself and tell you that, you know, the, the best tasting thing around back then was called Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill. It was really the only thing that tasted, you know, and, and now I think it must have been pretty gross, but it tasted kind of sweet. So you would generally need a mixer, uh, something to cut the alcohol with, and that serves to weaken the drink and reduce the amount of alcohol that you're drinking. Well, now hard liquor comes in all of these different flavors, like lemon and orange, um, cinnamon is very popular, candy flavors, and there's even a bacon-flavored vodka. And what age group would that appeal to, along with everything else that comes in bacon? Uh, so this is called flavor-infused alcohol, and it adds popular flavors. And so it tastes much better than the harsh taste of unflavored alcohol, and this creates less need for mixers. And so we have weaker drinks that are consumed at faster rates uh, than mixed drinks. Alcohol-infused food. Here's a, another fad. And these may be very appealing to grown-ups, but they're quite appealing to youth as well. Uh, Alcohol-infused whipped cream, the ones on the top left, Whipsy, are wine-infused. Some of the others are infused with different kinds of liquor, chocolate almond brownie, coconut cream pie. Um, also, um, foods like cupcakes with wine flavors or rum cakes. We've, we, you know, we've had rum cakes are an old thing, but this is a real trend to have um, alcohol infused food. And I was a little dismayed to see that uh, Haagen-Dazs is now making bourbon infused ice cream. Uh, you can see some examples of that on the, on the bottom. So uh, kids are ingesting alcohol in lots and lots of different really sweet and good tasting ways that weren't available so very long ago. RTDs. So RTD stands for ready to drink and ready to drink beverages um, aren't the sh cheap sugary stuff like the Alka Pops. Um, the craft movement has really kind of turned around some of the stigma related to Alka Pops and uh, low quality drinks. And so there's a huge wave of higher quality, ready to drink cocktails that's helped the, this category of drinks to kind of uh, sales to grow in double digits year over year in recent time. So here are some examples of, of those. Um, Joya has a you know, Cosmopolitan, a Giz, uh, Greyhound, a Moscow, Moscow Mule cocktail. And so when warm weather means outdoor gatherings and activities, um, the result is an explosion in sale of these, and they're very, very popular at parties now and uh, make it much easier for youth to, um, to get a mixed drink. Hard seltzer. Uh, I saw these everywhere that I went last summer, and hard seltzers are typically are fermented with sugar instead of malted barley, and that's uh, the difference between them and some of the other drinks. Um, White Claw, very popular brand, comes in five fruit flavors. Um, and hard seltzer sales in stores uh, increased by 187% in the year ending last July, uh, according to Nielsen. And so their sales are uh, going to eclipse a, the billion dollar mark uh, shortly. And again, these are very, very sweet, tasty drinks that are um, very popular with youth. Here's another trend, low APV healthy alcohol. So APV is alcohol by volume. So these are drinks that might have a lower alcohol content than some other drinks and some people um, 
you know, Michelob Ultra being kind of the standard that came first in this category. But people who maybe want a less alcohol, but perhaps it's less calories that they're looking for. And so some of these uh, things like uh, Fitvine, which is sponsored by CrossFit, uh, it's a growing brand of wines that contain less sugar, less carbs, less calories. Um, craft beers have also become more conscious of dietary uh, drawbacks. So New, New Belgium has a beer called Mural. It's only 110 calories, zero grams of sugar. Um, Harpoon uh, released Rec League, 120 calories a pint. Uh, daytime IPA. So these brands are targeting kind of active lifestyle consumers who want a more flavorful drink than the traditional, you know, locale go-to, which is the Niccolo Ultra. Uh, but they also appeal to teens and 20s who are conscious of their calorie intake when it comes to drinking. And so they might find themselves drinking these, thinking that they're healthier or better for you or you won't put on weight. Uh, but the market tends to be uh, heavily influenced at, at this point by these healthier trends. And Nielsen also noted that vodka trends um, are kind of moving toward the better for you movement with diet vodkas and sugar-free vodkas coming to the market. Here's a particularly dangerous fad. Uh, mixing energy drinks, and that's a whole other training that we could do on energy drinks and why, uh, why they're problematic. They contain a lot of substances that are harmful um, and just can cause a problem all by themselves. But mixing energy drinks with alcohol, sometimes this is known as booze and bull. Um, ads for this generally have a sexual connotation, such as get it up, keep it up. Um, it implies that you'll keep the party going longer without passing out. Um, another um, phrase is party like a rock star, rock star being one of the drinks. Uh, so keep you party partying. But the research results for this are alarming. The people that mix um, these energy drinks with alcohol at a party are more likely to drive drunk, ride with a drunk driver, become hurt or injured, need medical attention, or uh, even more likely to choke on their own vomit. This is a dangerous trend. Here's a trend that looks like fun to any young person, setting things on fire. Uh, flammable drinks, and even setting the bar on fire. And in order to make a flammable drink, you need an alcohol with a very high percent of alcohol to make that flammability. A couple examples of that are Bacardi 151 and Everclear. These are two uh, types of alcohol that are very dangerous for youth and young people, and they are drinking them. Um, you, can, you can develop alcohol poisoning fairly quickly with this high content alcohol. I read a quote from an adult who said, you know, if you go above the 151, you, you start to get less drinkable liquor and nobody would drink it, but Everclear does make a 95% version, uh, which we know that young adults and teens are, are drinking and it's quite dangerous. I'm gonna talk about a couple of trends that are um, mucous membrane ingestion, and I tried to find a graphic for this and I couldn't find one that wasn't gross. So we're just gonna talk for a minute about mucous membranes. Uh, so this is a trend, alcohol being absorbed through mucous membranes and bypassing the mitigating effects of the stomach. Um, so you think that uh, ingesting alcohol through mucous membranes works much faster and intensely in the body than traditional means. So the goal is a faster buzz um, and without vomiting. Um, approximately 20% of alcohol is usually absorbed in the stomach and 80% is absorbed in the small intestine. Um, the liver helps to filter out toxins to prevent us from ingesting too much alcohol, which is why we start puking. Uh, so typically alcohol stays in the bloodstream until it's broken down by the liver, but these unconventional methods through the mucous membrane 
uh, to get drunk, allow alcohol to directly enter the bloodstream and bypass the liver, and it can make the body susceptible to um, blood alcohol poisoning. So we're going to look at a couple of these, these uh, trends, and um, some of them we might think might even be kind of urban legend, Snopes type uh, trends, fad or fake, I call it. So the first one is vodka tampons. Um, and so I want to go back to the Tide Pods and Cinnamon Challenge and say that if something is a fake or an urban legend, once it hits the internet, uh, kids are going to try it. And so uh, what reason would they have for ins inserting vodka tampons? And this is not just a, a women or girls thing. This is uh, males as well inserting vodka soap, soaked tampons into the vagina or the rectum. And there are reasons uh, that they give for doing this. Um, to avoid bad breath is one reason. Uh, to avoid being caught by a breathalyzer test is another. Um, considering that alcohol is absorbed uh, by various parts of the body and makes its way into the bloodstream, it's not logical to think that the breath will be untainted. So breathalyzers measure uh, BAC, or blood alcohol content, and that means that the test is not relative to the breath per se, as much as the concentration of alcohol in the blood. So the mucous membrane method uh, can be dangerous and even deadly because it leads to faster intoxication. The alcohol is absorbed directly into the bloodstream and you can't reject it by vomiting. Uh, but one thing to be noted with vodka tampons, if you can think about how much vodka tampon can actually, actually absorb, it's probably about a shot. Uh, some of that's going to be lost. Um, and when the alcohol comes into direct contact with mucous membranes, uh, it's immediately um, pretty irritating and breaks down the, the tissues. And so it's not really a very good delivery system for alcohol. Fat or fake, butt chugging. Well, this is a thing. Uh, youth and college students and young adults uh, are doing this butt chugging. It's also known as an alcohol enema or boofing, B-O-O-F, boofing, uh, that involves ingesting alcohol through the rectum. And this involves a greater amount uh, being poured in. Some um, pictures that I saw online uh, was just the bottle itself inserted into the rectum. And the, uh, the abundance of capillaries and blood vessels in the rectum increase the speed that alcohol enters the bloodstream and bypasses the liver. So there are a couple of cases of people dying. In 2004, a Texas man died after his wife administered an uh, alcohol enema. Uh, his blood alcohol content soared to 0.47. And years later, 2004 is a while ago, eight years later, at the University of Tennessee, this was a trend uh, where one student was taken to the hospital with blood alcohol content of 0.40. Uh, which is five times the legal limit, and he did die shortly thereafter. One more mucous membrane method, eyeballing. Well, the eyeballing fad is the practice of drinking vodka by pouring the liquor directly into the eye. Um, reports of this practice surfaced in the media beginning in 2010, and hundreds of clips promptly showed up on YouTube purporting to engage in this practice. Uh, the proponents say that it causes rapid intoxication, which is really untrue because the amount that you can absorb through your eye is low. Um, vodka is 40% and inserting vodka into the eye creates inflammation and leads to very little being absorbed. Um, alcohol sears the capillaries and they close off rather quickly. The reported rush felt by teens, which are, you know, this is a fad, and it is kind of, wow, that was a great shot. Uh, more likely, it comes from the adrenaline, from the intense pain of eyeballing, rather than from the alcohol. And this can also lead to permanent eye damage.
There's a fad, smoking alcohol. You may not be familiar with smoking al alcohol, but this involves inhaling uh, vapors when alcohol is heated up. And so what we're looking at here is an ad for the Vapor Teeny. Um, and this retails for $30 online. And it involves heating a small amount of alcohol in a glass ball over a tea light and then sucking the resulting vapors through the straw. So it comes with the funnel, the straw, the glass ball, the Vapor Teeny ring to set your ball on. A candle, unfortunately, you have to provide your own glass. Uh, and so the myths for um, the advocating for smoking alcohol are that no calories, um, which is attractive to those who are conscious of their figure, that you'll pass a, a breathalyzer, again, since you're not drinking, um, but we know that it goes into the bloodstream. Um, and also there's a rumor that it's not illegal because you're not actually drinking. Uh, but it's not going to make a difference when it comes to blood alcohol level. And we do know that this rush right to the brain by pa passing the stomach is, uh, is a dangerous practice. We're going to look at some kind of um, party tactics and games uh, that are trends. And one of them that's particularly concerning is called pre-gaming. Um, sometimes it's called pre-loading or pre-drinking. And this is the act of drinking cheaper alcohol before you go out for the night. So you know when you go out to a party or a bar, you're going to have to buy your drinks. They're going to be fairly expensive. So uh, youth get together and pound back a few before they go out. Uh, some addiction activities. Experts believe that somewhere between 65 and 70 percent of college age people, so not necessarily in college, and I don't like to just talk about college because we have a lot of youth who don't go to college, but still engage in all of these things. Uh, a study found that students that engaged in pre-gaming are more likely to experience negative consequences associated with drinking. Uh, than those that don't drink before they go out, largely because Youth who pregame drink more alcohol than those who don't. In the study, students who drank before going out consumed an average of seven drinks per night, while students who solely drank at a bar club or party consumed around four. Uh, students who pregame are more likely to experience blackouts and engage in unprotected sex or unplanned drug use, and they were also more likely to obtain injuries. We're going to do another quiz, so get your chat box ready and tell me if you can name the game. Um, this is a game that became popular about 10 years ago and still continues. I thought it might be a really quick flash in the pan flat fad, but it continues. Can you name the game? Do we have anything in the chat? Nothing in the chat yet. Oh, nothing in the chat. That's good, because oh, that means yeah. you're learning something new. I uh, Two just came in. One said iced, and one said icing. Yes, icing. <laughs> so this is icing. It's also a game that's called Bros Icing Bros. This is a drinking game, and it's also become quite the internet meme. Um, and the, the game is, and this started, we think, in frat houses, um, but it, it happens all over the place now, uh, where one person hides a bottle of Smirnoff ice in a place that a friend is likely to find it, or a bro. And then, uh, upon finding it, that person has to immediately kneel on one knee and consume the ice, drink the ice. So Smirnoff ice is a malt beverage with a really sweet and fruity taste. Um, it doesn't have a very high alcohol content, but this game involves sudden, unexpected, unplanned drinking. 
Um, so the rules are you can't refuse an ice. If you refuse to drink the ice, you are shunned and you can never play ice again. Um, you can block an ice. If you're ice by a fellow bro, you can block an ice by pulling out your own ice and reversing it on your bro, and that person has to drink both of them. And so uh, that's part of the game. One concern is that uh, drinking unexpectedly uh, might occur, uh, such as before going out to an exam, to take an exam at school, um, before going out to drive a car, or heading to work. Uh, and if you reverse iced, you will have consumed two drinks unexpectedly before you do those things. And so these are, are hidden sometimes in a cargo pants pocket, uh, could be in the washing machine, in the apartment you share, in a cabinet, um, anywhere that you find the ice, you have to drink it. And so this has uh, become a popular fad. Just about everybody is familiar with beer pong, so I'm not going to ask you to name the game. But I just wanted to point out that this, this drinking game where you throw a ping pong ball across the table and you try to land it in a cup of usually beer on the other end. And if it lands in the cup, you drink the beer. I just wanted to point out the uh, appeal to youth here, Superman versus Batman, beer pong, so we're not talking about uh, adults necessarily. And I also found this frat party game, Pong Toss, for we and the concern that children may become acquainted with the drinking game uh, simply by, you know, it being part of the what's on the uh, on the shelf in terms of um, video games. Here's a here's a quiz, another game, see if you can name the game. All of these drinkers look very vigilant in building their towers here. We have one person who wrote wizard staff and another put towers. Yeah, wizard staffs or wizard sticks, towers. So here's the game. This is very frightening to me when I look at this picture. The basic premise of the game is simple. So you drink a can. And after finishing the next can, you duct tape it to the first empty can. And you repeat that process. So you're drinking each and every one of these cans and then taping them together uh, to resemble a stick or a staff. And each finished can can represent a level. This can get kind of geeky and complicated in terms of wizards battling with battles occurring every three cans and a battle might involve taking a shot. Uh, typically there are, you know, four or five challenges available and uh, sometimes when level 10 is achieved, you know, your fellow wizards present you with a challenge necessary to reach the ultimate class and strength of wizarding. Um, so if we count how many cans are in a staff or a stick, um, you know, I'm looking at this fellow in the middle who I can't even count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, more than 12 cans and perhaps some shots along the way. Uh, and the goal is to do this fairly quickly. And the, oh, by the way, how you win at wizard staffs is being the wizard with the longest staff. Sometimes um, height is taken into consideration, being the first one to reach your own height, or being the wizard who is the only one still conscious. Um, and you can then become the master of the wizard's council. If you're into the geeky version of play, um, sometimes all of those rules kind of go out the window and it's just a matter of drinking as fast as you can and taping these, you know, making towers and so forth. So we're talking about a rapid consumption of high amounts of alcohol. I want to talk about just another couple of kind of party games. You know, uh, most of us are familiar with jello shots. 
it gets pretty lazy when you don't even have to make your shots anymore. You can buy pre-made zippers, gelatin shots. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about how sexualized uh, some of this stuff becomes when the idea is maybe to eat jello shots uh, uh, off of a girl's body. And there's also this new product called Suck and Blow. And Suck and Blow involves a jello shot in a tube and the idea is whose mouth is it going to end up in, uh, you know, the person at one end of the tube or the other. Someone mentioned uh, over-the-counter um, medicines. So over-the-counter cough syrup, it's important to be aware of alcohol in the home and um, limit alcohol use, uh, youth access alcohol. So we can see Robitussin varies in strength of alcohol depending on which version it is. Uh, VIX-44, NyQuil are about 10% alcohol. I grew up in a household of non-drinkers and NyQuil was the only alcohol that was ever found in my house. And that's the first drink that I ever consumed was NyQuil and it had a nice burning sensation in the stomach and um, you know, I always was hoping for the next cough to develop, um, but we have to be really aware of the amount of alcohol uh, that's available in the house and whether it goes missing or not. Also, if, if um, cough syrup bottles are found in a teen's room, that might be a cause for concern. So we have a program at UPC, that's the Ulster Prevention Council, that's called Hidden in Plain Sight. And it's a mock teen bedroom that we set up, and it contains about 60 items that indicate that a teen is using drugs or alcohol or engaging in self-harm. And I'm going to show you just a couple of items that we have that are called concealments that are ways to hide alcohol. And every one of these is available on Amazon.com. So I sometimes at work, if IT ever looked at my um, browsing history, they might be very concerned. I search for things like, where can I hide my drugs? Where can I hide my alcohol? And these things pop up, and we buy them. Um, there are very uh, different versions of concealment books. These are hollowed out, as you can see, for it, with a space for a flask or a space to hide drugs. How to Excel in College is my favorite, um, but this also comes in Harry Potter. You can get the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and unfortunately, even the Holy Bible. This is a concealment called a tampon flask. And there are a lot of venues now that will only let you bring in a bottle of water um, or your purse or your bag might get looked at so you can't bring in a flask or alcohol. Um, so these are little tubes that you can fill with booze and Security guards and, uh, oh, say, school administrators aren't likely to pay attention to tampons when they see them in a bag. In fact, they're likely to pretend that they didn't see them. Otherwise, it's kind of creepy, right? So um, these are pretty much kind of just plugged past and overlooked if they're in a bag. Uh, they also come in a dube tube version for uh, stashing marijuana which comes with kind of a little over, over cover that um, will hide the smell. Here's a similar uh, item. This one was a bargain. It was a set of three. This is from Amazon. And so these are two flasks. And they look like regular hand cream bottles. These also come in shampoo and conditioner bottles and any kind of um, you know, bottle that you can think of. But they come as empty tubes, and they come with a funnel. Um, to pour in the alcohol, and they come with some seals. So it looks like your lotion has never been opened, so that if you took the top off, you'd just see a sealed bottle. And as long as you fill it to the top, it feels right in terms of the weight and not, you know, if it's half empty, it's going to slosh around like water and give away that it's not lotion. But as long as it's full, um, it's, it's a concealment. And you can use them over and over because you get all of these extra seals with it. Here's another type of concealment. Um, this is a water bottle that has a hidden compartment in the middle. Um, you could stash some uh, weed or something like that in there, but you can also fill the bottom and top sections that come off with alcohol. 
And as long as it's clear, it's going to look like water. And the cap is important. So you'll see the cap to the right um, that makes the bottle look like it's never been opened. So, you know, when you uh, look at the bottle the way it is now, it looks kind of like maybe it's been screwed off and re-screwed re on. Well, these caps make it look like that seal hasn't been broken, but they really actually have. And you can get, you know, hundreds of these caps um, on Amazon, and they'll just make it look like any bottle that you have has never been opened. Um, that, that black packet in the middle is a little weird looking. Um, that is actually to uh, prevent whatever you put in the middle from, like marijuana, from smelling. It hides the odor. I'm going to throw in one more for fun. Um, the dram sandal, which has a hidden compartment for booze. And I don't know, color me nutty, but this one seems like a very nasty proposition if you wear it to, I don't know, say the beach. You might get a little sand or dirt or, I don't know, it just doesn't sound very appealing to me, but perhaps to a teen or young adult. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about tobacco trends. And I talk a little bit about tobacco today. Um, next week, next Wednesday, Caitlin Shea from Ulster Prevention Council is going to present on e-cigarette and vaping. So we're not going to focus much on them today, um, but I did want to talk about tobacco and in particular about uh, cigarettes today. Um, tobacco remains the number one cause of preventable death. And so it's important to continue to address it, even though smoking rates are going down. Um, we're all aware of the health dangers associated with smoking, and so I'm not going to go over them in detail. But we know that nicotine is highly addictive. And again, the brain at, at, in youth is uh, highly susceptible to becoming addicted if you begin use at an early age. And the tobacco companies have known this for decades and decades. Uh, here are some old tobacco ads, and um, they use cartoons, the Flintstones, an image of a cheerleader, Joe Camel, who is a cartoon character, um, and some actual quotes from um, the tobacco industry that say that the base of their business is a high school student, and today's teenager is tomorrow's a potential regular customer. Um, the overwhelming majority of smokers first begin to smoke while still in their teens. In fact, 88% of smokers are exposed to nicotine by the time they're 18 years old. And once you get past that window, people are way less likely to start smoking. So tobacco companies know that, and they use their ads to find new customers. Uh, in fact, tobacco companies have called smokers, new young smokers, replacement smokers for those that die due to smoking. And I find that when I talk to youth about that, they get very angry when they find that um, tobacco companies are actually trying to get them hooked in order to uh, continue their revenue stream. One old advertising strategy was to claim that cigarettes were actually good for your health. And this eventually got the tobacco companies into a lot of trouble. Uh, this might seem like ancient history. If you've seen, I love looking at some of these old ads that claim that, um, you know, doctors smoke more camels than other cigarettes or that cigarettes are actually good for you. Um, but as you might notice, uh, tobacco companies aren't the type to give up easily. And they have new marketing techniques to bring in new cigarette customers. And so they've developed new products and advertise them using the same old techniques. So here we see products claiming to be more healthy are actually being touted again. And these are products that uh, say that they're, they smoke like a real cigarette without smoker's cough and so on. We know that smoking rates climbed until 1964 when the Surgeon General published a report that explained the harmful effects of smoking. And up until that point, tobacco, the public suspected that smoking was bad for your health. 
Um, but this groundbreaking report confirmed it. And after the report was released, trends began to decrease. Uh, the tobacco industry company's uh, manipulation was exposed, and accurate information from a trusted source was finally available to the public through the CDC. So in terms of tobacco control and what will help us to uh, lessen the uh, amounts of youth who start to smoke, um, the decline in smoking didn't happen overnight. Many public policies were put into place to discourage people from smoking. So for instance, in 1965, the Federal Cigarette Labeling and Advertising Act required warning labels. In 1971, the Surgeon General proposed a ban on, on smoking in public places. Uh, in 1998, advertising targeted at young people was prohibited and higher taxes were placed on cigarettes. And we know that higher taxes uh, increase in cost is something that decreases, has a direct effect on decreasing the amount of uh, alcohol and tobacco use. So these kinds of policies help us to fight back against the big advertising push from large tobacco companies. Uh, you might hear that the tobacco companies say they don't want kids to start smoking. Uh, however, in countries that don't have these kind of policies in place, the same companies still market to children and they sell to children and they hold promotional events aimed at increasing smoking and brand loyalty. Um, investigations by the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids show that tobacco companies are targeting children in every country where we've looked in low and middle income countries in Europe, Latin America, Africa and Asia. Tobacco companies like Philip Morris and British American Tobacco still aggressively advertise to kids. So I just say that to say that we can't really believe the companies when they say that they don't want kids to smoke. There's some cigarette use rates. Across time, we continue to see cigarette use coming down in the United States. And it's interesting to see that the rates in New York are lower than the national rates. And we think that this is mainly due to New York spending the tobacco company master settlement money on prevention efforts. Well, a lot of other states took the money and used it for roads and infrastructure. And smoking rates are still higher in uh, states that grow a lot of tobacco as well. About 14% of adults in New York smoke about 17% of adults in the United States smoke. This is from 2017. Uh, if we look at high school students, about 5.5% of high school students reported smoking, while the national rate is 8.8%. And so we see some signs of hope that high school students, uh, you know, if they're not starting at these younger ages, eventually we'll see the rates of adult smoking uh, declining as well. In other tobacco product use, um, we're gonna, as I said, we're not gonna talk so much about e-cigarettes today, but I just wanted to look at the statistic. Um, high school students use other tobacco products at rates higher than adults. Almost four times as many high school students vaped in New York as adults in 2017, about 2.5 percent of adults reported using smokeless tobacco or chew, and 4.6 percent of high school students reported using smokeless tobacco. Uh, you might think that fewer youth than adults would smoke cigars, but we see that a whopping 7.7 percent of high school students reported smoking cigars. Um, this might have something to do with the available flavors of cigars and cigarillos and also using cigars to roll uh, marijuana blunts. As I said, we're gonna do another presentation where Katie's gonna discuss e-cigarettes and vaping, but we're gonna look at a few reasons why these rates might be higher for youth. So here's a quiz for your chat box. What is it? This is not apple juice. This is not for your child's lunch. What is it? If you know or you want to guess, you can post your answer in the chat box.
What's in our juice box? Do we have any guesses in there? No guesses yet. No guesses? OK. Well, amazingly enough, this is called One Mad Hit Juice Box. And this is e-liquid for e-cigarettes or vape devices. So the e-liquid label calls the product a juice box. And it looks pretty much like a juice box that you would buy at your local grocery. It even has an image of a sippy straw on the side of the box. Um, and if you open it, you will even smell apples. But this is liquid that goes into an e-cigarette or vape device, and it can be fatal to kids who ingest as little as a teaspoon of this juice. So if we look at who this is trying to appeal to, I don't see too many older people going for the one mad hit juice box with the straw on the side. Fortunately, in New York, we're working on flavor bans. New York has moved to ban all flavored tobacco because flavored tobacco products are appealing to youth. There's still a lot of debate about flavors. Uh, there are some people that say the flavored products for vapes and e-cigarettes might make it easier for adults to switch over. Um, but these flavors are completely banned in New York City, and we're looking at a ban in the state. The biggest debate is about menthol or mint flavors. Usually, um, vape devices will talk about mint, and they may switch over to using the word menthol flavored if that's the only allowed flavor. And this is a, a cultural issue because um, menthol flavor is heavily marketed in African-American communities, and rates of use for menthol um, cigarettes are much higher in African-American communities. Looking at some new tobacco companies and how they still are reaching out to uh, new markets and to youth, um, if you see the little girl holding the two packages, on the left is actually gum, sugarless gum you know, take five gum. And then a new camel package with, uh, you know, hot pink labeling appealing to girls. And we know that camel was originally pretty much marketed toward rugged men, right? But we'll see the new camel number nine pack on the left, light and luscious, very much appealing to, to women and to younger smokers. Here's another new product. Camel orbs. Um, these, these actually come in sticks and strips as well. But these are really interesting products. They're dissolvable tobacco products. They're made of finely milled tobacco. And so they kind of slowly dissolve in your mouth. Um, a survey in Virginia found that 39% of youth under 18 thought that these new orbs was candy. It looks a lot like a Tic Tac, which is why I put the Tic Tacs up there. And I also want you to take a look at the ad for orbs and think about how old this girl looks. Although they probably used an actress who was over 18 to, uh, to make this ad, she appears to be much younger than that. A study by the Harvard School of Public Health and the Centers for Disease Control on unintentional child poisonings from ingestion of tobacco products, uh, excess toxicity of camel orbs, um, which they said are of concern due to their discrete form, candy-like appearance, and added flavorings that may be attractive to young children. Uh, the lead researcher noted that a small pellet with a rapid release of nicotine and a young child with a low body weight can be a very serious problem by creating potential for nicotine poisoning, for example. And uh, that's pretty ugly. Nicotine poisoning manifests as cramps, drooling, tremors, nausea, vomiting, agitation, and in more extreme cases, seizures, coma, and death. There were over 13,000 tobacco product ingestion cases 
um, that were reported in a two-year period. And 70% of them occurred in infants less than one year of age. So this happens when things are left out and, and uh, the little ones are crawling around. It's, it's sad. Another newer type product, um, Snooze, it's been around for a little while. It's Snooze, rhymes with loose or goose. Uh, it's a smokeless, moist powder tobacco pouch that you place under your top lip. Um, this is a product that's you know been used um, and comes out of um, Scandinavian countries, but is now available here. And it comes in flavors like mint and wintergreen. Uh, you don't burn it. It's not like chew. You don't have to spit when you use it. Um, and it uh, is generally kept cold so that it has a little bit of a cool flavor to it. And this has become more popular as well. So just in terms of I was thinking about well, what's the impact as far as tobacco now that we're uh, sheltering in place, COVID-19, um, in general, usually about four out of 10 children age three to 11 are exposed to secondhand smoke in the home. Uh, that's a pretty high percentage. Um, in the US, the percentage of children and teens living with at least one smoker is about three times the percentage of non-smoking adults who live with a smoker. So children are involuntarily becoming secondhand smokers. So I was thinking too about, so we have adults at home with their children a lot more now and perhaps smoking uh, inside. And there's also kind of a catch-22 for smokers in this in that if you're going to go smoke outside, are you leaving small children unsupervised in order to do that? And so um, we have a pretty rough situation in terms of secondhand smoke. So secondhand smoke is smoke from burning tobacco products, uh, but it's also smoke that's been exhaled or breathed out by the person smoking. We know that secondhand smoke contains more than 7,000 chemicals, including hundreds that are toxic and about 70 that can cause cancer. There's no free risk level of secondhand smoke exposure. Even brief exposure can be harmful to health. Um, since 1964, when we started keeping track, about 2.5 million non-smokers have died from health problems caused by exposure to secondhand smoke. And we also know that in children, secondhand smoke causes other problems, such as ear infections, uh, more frequent and severe asthma attacks, respiratory symptoms, uh, respiratory infections, and also a greater risk for sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. I also want to just make you aware of third hand smoke. If you're not familiar with third hand smoke, uh, the National Environmental Health Association tells us that thir third hand smoke is nicotine residue that remains on surfaces after someone has smoked, including the walls, doors, drapery, carpets, clothes, furniture, flooring material, and even acoustic tiles and ceilings. And people, especially seniors and children, and even your pets, are affected by this um, underappreciated health hazard, through skin exposure, dust inhalation, and ingestion. So some of the chemicals found in third-hand smoke, which is this residue on surfaces, include hydrogen cyanide, butane, toluene, arsenal, arsenic, lead, carbon monoxide, and polonium-210, which is a radioactive carcinogen. Uh, research has demonstrated that tobacco smoke is a toxic substance with no safe level of exposure, and the risks are dose-related. So third-hand smoke um, affects people who live in homes, hotels, or are in any indoor environment that was used long-term by smokers. Even cars used by smokers can have third-hand smoke residue. Uh, babies, toddlers, and children are at greater risk of negative health effects because they inhale much more than adults. Um, they have greater hand-object-mouth contact 
So you can kind of picture a toddler toddling its way around along a coffee table, gripping the table with their drooly wet hands and sticking their hands in their mouth and uh, greater absorption also through the skin. Third hand smoke can be present in homes even if they've been vacant for two months and are cleaned and prepared for new residents. Um, so that has led to the, the um, smoke-free homes and cars campaign, uh, which encourages people to not expose anyone to second or third hand smoke. So I hope that you've enjoyed learning a little bit today about alcohol and tobacco trends. And I hope that you will enjoy us, uh, join us on Monday, May 4th at 12 p.m. Uh, for an online Narcan training presented by the New York National Guard. And following this training, you'll be able to get the Narcan delivered to you uh, with COVID-19 restrictions in place if you participate in our online Narcan training. And then on Wednesday, May 6th at noon, Caitlin Shea is going to present a training on e-cigarettes, jewel, uh, jewel, and vaping. So you'll be able to learn much more about that. And here is my contact info, cdepalo at familyservicesny.org. And we'll just open up for any comments or questions. And thank you so much for taking the time out to be with us for the first part of our educational exposition. Uh, and we hope to see you a lot more as we continue the series.